Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Singer. I'm a general surgeon and a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. In uh, mid-November 2020, the Food and Drug Administration proudly announced it approved the first at-home self-administered test for COVID-19. Amidst the concern that asymptomatic carriers may unknowingly spread the virus, and with testing crucial to discriminating between those who can go to work and those who should quarantine, this announcement seemed like a wonderful breakthrough until reading the fine print. It turns out that the test, brand named Lucera COVID-19 All-in-One Test Kit, requires a prescription from a licensed healthcare practitioner who is instructed to prescribe it only to symptomatic patients before one someone may purchase and self-administer the test. This not only defeats the purpose of an at-home test, but it runs counter to the goal of restraining contagion. One month later, the FDA approved an, an app-based test, at-home test called Binax Now, that also requires a prescription and users must have COVID symptoms. The app-based telehealth provider reports the findings to the public health authorities. And around the same time, the FDA finally approved a different at-home test called Elum that doesn't require a prescription, but again, uses a mobile phone app to analyze a nasal swab and the app shares the results with public health authorities who can maintain surveillance. This is not the first time the FDA obstructed individuals from obtaining information about their health status. In the early 1970s, the FDA temporarily halted at-home self-administered pregnancy tests. The FDA restricted at-home HIV tests developed in the late 1980s, well until the early 21st century. Currently, the FDA strictly curtails the development of at-home genetic testing, useful in screening for hereditary diseases. In every instance, regulators paternalistically cited concerns that patients may unwisely use the information that they obtained. Does this regulatory conduct exceed authority granted by the 1976 Medical Device Amendments to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act? Should regulatory authority be more clearly defined as restricted to the safety and accuracy of at-home tests? Most important is the FDA violating the fundamental right of autonomous adults to obtain information about their health status. We couldn't have a more appropriate panel of experts to discuss this issue. We have with us today Nita Farahani, who is the Robinson O. Everett Professor of Law and Philosophy at Duke Law School. She's the founding director of Duke Science and Society, chair uh, of, of the Duke Masters of Arts in Bioethics and Science Policy Program, and principal investigator of Duke's Science, Law, and Policy Lab. And Policy Lab. In 2010, she was appointed by President Obama to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues and served there until 2017. Jessica Flanagan is with us, and she's an assistant professor of leadership studies and philosophy, politics, economics, and law as well as the Richard L. Morrill Chair in Ethics and Democratic Values at the University of Richmond. In her book, Pharmaceutical Freedom, published by Oxford University Press in 2017, she defends the rights of self-medication. Jessica is also published in journals such as Philosophical Studies, the Journal of Business Ethics and Leadership, the Journal of Moral Philosophy, and the Journal of Political Philosophy. I'll ask each of our panelists to make opening remarks. Then we'll have a discussion and take questions and answers from participants. I'll be moderating the Q&A. I encourage people who are watching this, participants, to write your questions either on our event page or via Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, and use the hashtag, hashtag Cato Health. That's with a capital C and capital H. And please be sure to visit the Cato Institute, Institute event page uh, for the links to additional resources that are related to the topic of this event. This event. Nita, let me start with you. Please um, give us an overview of the medical device uh, amendments and how they've impacted ho at home testing. The too much depth. Um, and let me just first say it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, and I'm delighted for us to be talking about what I think is really a crucial topic, which is um, what is the role of the FDA and what is the role of the individual in being able to make autonomous choices about their health and their well being? And fundamentally, what is our right to access information about ourselves? Um, so if you look at the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, it has um, the authority for the FDA, which is really quite broad, to be able to regulate medical devices. Um, and most tests, whether it's a COVID test or another kind of test, falls under medical devices. Um, generally, it's because uh, they are kits. Um, they involve different reagents or other kinds of um, equipment that, when combined together, 
uh, are administered in order to be able to um, diagnose, uh, treat, uh, or prevent some kind of a disease. And so broadly under the 1976 um, amendments to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which gives the FDNCA broad authority over uh, medical devices, they have the power and the authority to regulate the safety and efficacy of those devices. And devices are generally classified based on uh, the kind of risk that they pose. And so there are class one, class two, and class three devices. Class one devices are generally those devices that are considered the safest devices and they're permitted to uh, be on the market um, with generally just pre-market notification, but not um, strict regulatory oversight. Um, class two devices uh, generally go through something called uh, substantial equivalence. That is, they get approval to be on the market based on the fact that they're substantially equivalent to some other existing device that's on the market. And then class three devices are those devices that are brand new. That is, they um, don't have a corollary that exists on the marketplace. And so they require a much more extensive process of review by the FDA in order to be approved. Um, and that's Re that review and approval generally requires that they go through things like clinical testing and um, provide evidence of their safety and efficacy. What's at issue, I think, here is a, a couple of ways in which the FDA thinks about regulating devices. The first is the risk that the device poses to the individual. And in general, if you're talking about at-home testing, there's very little risk, right? Doing a nasal swab has very little physical risk to you. Um, and so the FDA generally looks to say um, there's a couple of different issues that they might have. They might have concerns about the analytic validity of a test before allowing it to be on the marketplace. That is, if it says that you're positive for a test, is it accurately reporting um, that positivity? Uh, and then the clinical validity, which is um, it might get like a DNA sequence right, but then is the interpretation that the device manufacturer is providing um, is that also a valid interpretation that can be provided? So that's the basics of FDA regulatory approval. But the biggest issue, the thing that we really have to focus our, our conversation on is FDA's authority to regulate devices based on safety and efficacy. And if safety is about making sure that the devices don't harm you, um, does that include whether or not it psychologically harms you? That is, is the information somehow something that's harmful? And does the FDA have the right to regulate information and to protect your psychological well-being and psychological welfare at this very kind of paternalistic notion? Or if a device is proven to be safe from the perspective of it poses very little physical, if any, risk to you, and it's proven to be efficacious, that is, it has appropriate analytic validity, it you know, if it says that you have the following genetic sequence or it says that there is the presence of the following kind of antibody in your blood or the kind of um, antigen which would suggest the presence of something like SARS-CoV-2 uh, is the clinical interpretation, that is that you're positive for uh, infection or that you're positive for some interpretation of a genetic variation, um, is that also efficacious? And if we limited what the FDA did to ensuring the validity of tests, but not trying to regulate the psychological well-being of individuals, I think there are very few tests that um, the FDA would likely restrict under its uh, under its authority. So that's just kind of a basic overview. We can get into all of the details and uh, go a little bit further, but that gives just a basic primer, I think, for our conversation. Well, thank you, Jessica. Uh, you're a philosopher and bioethicist, so I'm really interested to hear your thoughts about the ability of the FDA to uh, to to um, uh, regulate at-home testing like they do today, and, and to deny people, like for example, in the case of the, these two COVID tests that we talked about, deny them the ability of getting the information themselves. So, let's hear your thoughts about it. Um. Sure. Well, first, thank you for having me. And as you said, I'm a philosopher, so I focus a lot on the normative justifications around what the FDA is doing. Can that be justified? And I think there are a lot of normative assumptions in how we approach pharmaceutical regulation that often go unquestioned, but that we should question. So the first is when tests are regulated, as Nina mentioned, it's often based on ideas of like safety. But safety is a normative judgment. It's not a scientific judgment. So it's not as if medical experts can get together in a room and say, oh, there it is, that's the level of acceptable risk 
that we will allow people to expose themselves to. Um, rather, a judgment of acceptable risk is a judgment about, you know, how learning additional information is going to fit into the fabric of a person's life more broadly, how it uh, might interact with their other values. That's not the kind of judgment, that kind of values-based judgment, that regulators are generally well-placed to make. And those types of safety judgments are even more dubious in the of testing rather than like, for example, pharmaceuticals, because tests don't necessarily affect the structure or function of a person's body on their own. That would require additional medical intervention, which is also regulated through gatekeepers like physicians and the FDA. Um, tests are just producing information. So the risks of tests are already presumptively very low because any informational harms associated with a test would be reversible, unlike other kinds of medical injuries. And the risk can be made even lower if all of the unknowns surrounding tested testing are clearly disclosed and communicated to users and clinicians so everybody can give consent. Um, in our current system, like the possible harms of a test being offered to a person are far exceeded by the harms of withholding access to a test. So some people think, well, the ethics of regulation is that they should intervene to keep us safe. Um, but sometimes the intervention puts people even more at risk. And the incentives that public officials at FDA, public officials more generally face in public health are to restrict access for the sake of public safety. But those incentives cause them to overlook the risks of delaying access. So now over 400,000 people have died of coronavirus. Imagine an alternative reality where we had widespread access at your local CVS or Walgreens to rapid test strips that people could take just you know three times a week regularly to see if they were uh, at risk of contagious transmission of coronavirus. They could take it at home. Cheap test strips that cost you know one to ten dollars per strip, um, and everybody just had widely available rapid test strips in the way that we can widely access you know Tylenol or something like that at the local pharmacy. Uh, just giving people access to the ability to do rapid testing would have enabled people to redu reduce the rates of contagious transmission and save lives. But those types of risks, the risks of regulation, often are overlooked in discussions of whether or not to approve things like at-home testing. Instead, public officials focus on the potential harms of having more information about a person's body, which is not a type of judgment of harm or risk that public officials are really in a good position to make anyhow. What I find particularly offensive was um, that back uh, in, I think it was 1988, when the, there was just huge death rates from HIV, um, several companies had developed at-home tests for HIV. Uh, originally, these were at-home tests that you could take a sample and then send it in to be evaluated, but they actually came out with kinds that... Um, that you could do the whole test on your own at home. And I think it was up until the mid 1990s that the FDA wasn't even allowing applications for, for these tests to get approved. They were, they were not accepting them. They, they basically banned companies that had developed at home tests from submitting these tests for FDA approval. And the reasoning they gave was that, well, we're concerned that if somebody learns that they have HIV, um, they may get so depressed, they're liable to, instead of seeking medical attention, they're liable to do something like take their own life. Uh, and think about how many, how many lives probably uh, were lost because of that. But aside from that, to, to me, it offends, it's, I find it offensive that, that they're judging, um, you know, they, they're basically just deciding for people how they should use the information. Um, as opposed to letting them get the information. Uh, Nito, tell us, you were nodding your head when I was saying that. Maybe you could elaborate on that. <clears throat> I think it's useful to put out what some of the best arguments are in favor of, uh, of, of why people think it makes sense to have some regulation with respect to at-home testing. Yeah, be good. I, yeah. likewise, I likewise find it um, deeply problematic to, to limit it and, and, and think that there are significant public health implications. Um, some of it is this, you know, risk of psychological harm. People are afraid that somebody will react in a way uh, that is disproportionate to the information. Um, you know, you see the same thing when 23andMe received some of its earlier 
uh, and very stringent warning letters from the FDA that um, required that it stop marketing uh, the clinical interpretations of the variants that it was reporting on. Um, one of the concerns that it expressed was uh, reporting on uh, on BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, the, the genetic predisposition to breast cancer. And they said something to the effect that they were worried that people would go out and have double mastectomies um, in response to the information, which by the way, wouldn't be utterly irrational if, if that did happen in certain instances. Um, Angelina Jolie did that based on family history and in consultation with her physician. And it also uh, really sells people short in the idea that that's something, you know, I, I'm not going to lop off my breasts on my own. I'm going to go consult with my physician and get information. Um, but a second reason really is, is an education reason, which is um, there's a fear that people may not have adequate information to be able to interpret tests and interpret the results. And so, you know, just by way of example, uh, if you have your hemoglobin tested um, and, you know, it's slightly outside the reference range, um, if you have training as a medical physician, you may understand that those slight variations don't actually mean much, if at all. Uh, and that, you know, a little point here, a little point there might just be a variation in testing or what you ate or something like that. But we're really looking at more major deviations from the norm to determine whether or not somebody has an abnormal test. And so there's this fear that people have a lack of adequate information to be able to appropriately interpret the tests. But again, I don't think that the answer then is to prohibit any um, access to the test. It suggests that we need to offer much greater education and resources and materials to enable people to make informed choices and informed decisions. And if you're talking about something like uh, a SARS-CoV-2 test, um, a COVID test, you know, there's there's a few potential rationale for not making access available to individuals. One is, of course, the major shortage of the tests. Um, and that is a problem, right? There's a public health rationale for trying to have um, you know, kind of the highest and best use of tests in, a, in an instance of restricted resources. A second is there is a high um, likelihood, or not a high likelihood, but there's there's differences of sensitivity and specificity of these tests that have received emergency use authorization. They haven't been fully validated yet. And so there's this fear that people will act inappropriately based on that information. That is, um, they may, in fact, be positive if they have a false negative and stop doing things like social distancing or wearing masks or other best practices because they don't know what the full context is. Um, or they may know that they're positive and continue to um, interact with other people, uh, choose to ignore the results and the risks for other people. And at a time of a public health crisis, maybe we do need some way to ensure that there's notification of public health officials if we want to have a society in which this kind of communitarian ethic of of trying to bring the pandemic under control based on shared information and reporting exists. So I think there are some decent arguments um, about uh, a need for greater education, a need uh, for the distribution of resources to the kind of highest and best use in a time of a global pandemic, and this kind of complicated question of how do you address the fact that there may be at-home testing where individuals gain information that we might need access to in a public health setting to be able to act um, in the best interests of the community writ large. But I don't think the answer to that is to restrict any potential access for individuals. I think it's to do things like massively increase the availability of testing, to increase education and resources to individuals to make informed choices. And then we have to figure out the harder uh, answer, which is if we have easy rapid at-home tests, is there a right to access that information by public health officials um, in a time of a global pandemic? And how would we make that happen? Uh, Jessica, I think you wanted to say something about this with respect to physicians. Sure, well, you brought up the case of um, restricting access to HIV testing on the grounds that people might engage in some kind of reckless or harmful behavior um, in, 1968, they did a survey of oncologists, and they asked they asked oncologists if they ever lied to patients about a cancer diagnosis. And 90% of oncologists said sometimes they did. Sometimes they would tell patients they didn't have cancer, when in fact they did. And then when they asked oncologists in the follow-up interviews, well, why are you doing that? The oncologist said, well, um, if we told people that they might make reckless decisions, they might harm themselves in some ways, it might be so emotionally damaging that it would further um, shorten their lifespan because of the emotional trauma of learning that they had cancer. So physicians, even into the 60s, would routinely hold diagnoses from their patients. 
Now we recognize that that was monstrous and that's a clear violation of informed consent. It's not the physician's decision to make the call about whether or not somebody um, should know that they have cancer or not. They need that information so that they can make voluntary treatment decisions going forward. Um, that kind of paternalism, we generally reject in clinical contexts. For the very same reasons, we should reject it today when it comes to patients accessing tests. And in the case of contagious transmission, like HIV or right now like coronavirus, there's an even stronger reason in favor of advocating for giving people information about their status, which is that once people learn if they have the status of being a potential vector of illness, then they can take measures to prevent it. But if it's difficult for them to get tested, then it's also difficult for them to know that they should be taking measures to prevent themselves from becoming a vector of illness. And I can throw in my own two cents as a practicing physician. Um, in my state, my state's one of the majority of states now, I think there are about still 17 states that don't allow this, where people can go uh, to, to, the, uh, to any laboratory and without having to get a doctor's prescription can order a test. Now their insurance carrier may not uh, pay for it if it was done that way, but it, it's perfectly legal in most states where you could just decide, I, want, I think I want to, want to get a, a, a blood count, see if I'm anemic. And you could just go to a lab and say, I'd like to get a CBC or a cholesterol test or whatever. At first, there was some resistance from uh, medical professionals to that idea. Some were saying, well, you know, they're not going to know how to interpret it. Maybe they may interpret it the wrong way. But the prevailing argument was, well, you know, if they have any questions, there's nothing that prevents them from seeking the advice of somebody like you, a medical professional, and ask them how they should interpret it and whether or not they should act on it. So, um, but that's a similar kind of thing. So it, it's, it's not just direct to consumer at home tests that the FDA regulates on the state level, the state allows some states per, still prevent people from ordering their own lab tests from a lab. Um, uh, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, let me start with Nita. Why do you think that the uh, uh, FDA didn't, the, the first two tests that are at-home tests, they required a prescription, even though one of them uh, has an app that informs uh, public health officials. And then the third one, um, Illu Illu Illuma, they don't require a, a prescription. Why do, you, why do you think that is? So I haven't looked at the specifics to figure out the distinction between the two. My guess would be a difference in uh, expected interpretation of the test. Uh, that is um, how to administer and how to um, how to interpret the information that you receive. Uh, you know, if you take a saliva test, for example, it's quite easy to administer. Um, if it's something like a pregnancy test where it's just one line means it's negative and two lines means it's positive, that's very easy to interpret for the at-home user. Uh, so it, you know, it could be as simple as a matter of what they thought was easier to administer and interpret, uh, and therefore um, easier for at-home users to not have to go through the prescription. Um, and you know, the alternative would be uh, that it was done in order to um, ensure that there was the the paternalistic touch of the physician in, engaged. That uh, you know, you. Um, have to go through the physician to get the information. Presumably the physician gets access to the information about whether or not you've tested positive. That could go back into the public health information and inform public health officials, uh, or also you know, give you access to a physician who could advise you about the medical care that you needed to receive, if any, or the steps that you needed to take next, if any, uh, after receiving a positive, um, a positive test. Yeah, and, and but ironically, in the in the case of the first one, the Lucera, um, according to the FDA's instructions, after you get the prescription, you don't need to be at the doctor's office. You can go ahead and take the test on your own because you it's designed for you to do this without any professional helping you. Right. So it's almost right, like you but, just but need a permission a from a screener. Right. But there's there's a difference, right, between somebody knowing. Uh, that you have a test and being able to inquire and saying like, hey, what, what were the test results that you received versus being able to anonymously go to a store and, and gain access to that information. And that was part of what was involved in the HIV tests as well. There was a worry, not just that people would psychologically, um, you know, make decisions or commit suicide as a result of the information that they received. There was also um, this belief that potentially 
there wasn't a right to anonymously have access to information about whether what your HIV status was, that perhaps um, given the uh, public health dimensions of being HIV positive, that there was a right of others to um, have access to that information as well. And, you know, and that's, that's, that's more complicated, that's difficult, right? right? In, in the middle of a pandemic of a highly contagious uh, um, virus, you know, is there a right to anonymously know that you have SARS-CoV-2 uh, and to then go about and engage in public in any way that you wish and see fit if you receive that positive diagnosis or is there some right um, of knowledge on the part of the community to know that you are positive and therefore to regulate your movements and your actions? Well, Jessica, what, what's the, uh, what, what's a good solution to that uh, tension that, that Nita just talked about? I mean, I think even if there are public health risks um, associated with contagious transmission, the testing thing is sort of a side issue. So in my view, you shouldn't need a permission slip to get access to information about your own body. And you shouldn't need to necessarily wait several days in order to get that permission slip. The several day delay essentially makes a lot of the testing kind of purposeless because when we have this multi-day delay for test people having access to testing, um, they're already potentially a vector of illness. They're already potentially exposing people to coronavirus. Now, if you think that it's wrong for people to be transmitting coronavirus and that that should be monitored or in some cases maybe punished or something, um, my own intuition is that that's likely to be counterproductive. So you don't want to disincentivize people getting tested as a general matter. If people have some worry that being tested would open them up kind of like punitive sanctioning or invasive monitoring um, in a way that could be on balance harmful for them, that would disincentivizing testing. But the thing that we should be doing is incentivizing widespread rapid at-home testing because on balance, the benefits of having widespread at-home testing are still going to exceed the potential risks that some people might knowingly expose others to coronavirus, which is already a risk currently, even in the absence of having testing. So um, just for the principle of the matter, I don't think you should need this permission slip. And just on the kind of public health consequentialist view of this, I think it might be counterproductive to withhold access to testing on those grounds because um, it might diminish uptake for people choosing to get tested. Nita, anything you want to say about that or? Yeah, I mean, so so in principle, I agree, right? And in principle, I'm strongly in favor of self-access to information about oneself. That said, I do believe that there are certain kinds of um, moments like a global pandemic that could justify other restrictions on liberty, not uh, like what's the question is, what's the best way to achieve that? Right. And I don't think limiting access to testing is the best way to achieve that, but there might be a duty to report. Um, and, you know, I'm just positing one possible solution, which is, uh, you know, is there a duty to report a positive mm -hmm. test? Um, is there, uh, you know, some um, right to surveillance of, of wastewater or other types of things such that the control of the spread in, in the community and society is, is permissible beyond that? Now, that's these are kind of separate and aside questions. And I, I put them out there not to say that this is the this is the right policy solution, but to suggest that even if you're concerned, even if the reason that you would believe the right answer to restrict testing is because of a failure um, of notice or notification to public health officials if somebody tests at home and tests positive, there are other policy solutions that could be put into place um, rather than limiting self-access. And you know, I'll just give an anecdotal um, example of the value of self-testing. So um, my husband and I were both uh, participants in the Moderna research trial. Um, and we've now both been unblinded in that trial. And um, I received the vaccine and he received the placebo. Um, about a month and a half ago now in early December, um, my husband had a fever one day. And uh, I had access to, um, to, to nasopharyngeal rapid tests, antigen tests, um, for SARS-CoV-2 at home. And so I administered one of these SARS-CoV tests to him um, and you know, did it sort of on a lark, like, oh, you have a fever. Uh, it's very unlikely that it's COVID, but there's no other thing that you might have. So let's just test and see what happens. And this is the first day he had any kind of symptom. And lo and behold, he was positive 
And we're like, what? I mean, is that, is that accurate? And is that true? But we instantly put his mask on. We have two small children. Um, you know, we isolated him. And uh, he then called up the Moderna study in order to let them know that he had tested positive and he needed, he needed to come in for a PCR test. And he contacted um, our local hospital and said, hey, can I come in for a, a test as well? The earliest he could get a test was the next day with the local hospital. With the Moderna study, it was uh, two days later for a sick visit. Um, the Moderna study didn't give him his results back at all. I think it was like a week or 10 days later that they finally gave him the results that it was positive. Um, whereas the local hospital gave him the results a day later after that. So he tests positive at home on Tuesday. We get the first confirmation um, and the ability to test through our outside of the home testing services on Friday. But in the meantime, we've managed to isolate him and we're fortunate in that nobody else in the household got sick. Uh, we have an au pair who lives with us. We have two small children. Nobody else got it. Uh, he was the only one who had it and we isolated him for you know, a, a 10 day period until he came out. Um, and we quarantined the family for a couple of weeks after he tested positive. But I bet if we had waited until Friday that the entire family, maybe other than me because I had received the vaccine, would have tested positive. Um, and it you know, just goes to the point of the value of rapid at-home testing and the difference between our current access to testing in the marketplace versus at home can be vast and it can lead to a significant difference between the health of the individuals in the community, whether or not it's spread, um, et cetera, et cetera. And to be clear, that wasn't an, uh, a marketable at-home test. That was, no. you had access no. to a test. Okay. okay. Yeah. So in the same um, way that a lot yeah. of places you can get uh, things like, you know, walk-in labs or, um, you know, you can, you can order labs for yourself and go to LabCorp for different tests. There are a lot of these different kinds of tests that are administered in doctor's offices that are not that hard to find online. Um, and you can go online, you can order them. You know, it could be something like a strep test at home, other types of tests. Uh, and, you know, I, I look for them, I order them, and I have some of those tests available for my family so that we can know when somebody gets sick and be able to have that information much sooner than we otherwise would. Uh Jessica, did you want to say something? I saw you, uh, or you just were enjoying the story. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I would like to, before we go on to some, uh, some questions, could you uh, talk about the whole 23andMe thing? People are getting advertisers all the time about, for example, saliva tests like uh, um, Ancestry.com. It's, it's a similar kind of thing where you could, 23andMe came out, I think it was 2013, and you could, test to see uh, if you have anywhere of the number, I think 240 different genetic uh, predispositions to things. And the FDA put a, put clamped down on that. Um, uh, Nita, why don't you tell, tell us about it first? I'm going to ask Jessica to comment about it. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've written about this a good bit and, and it, it's a good example of the FDA stepping in and, and using this kind of conception of safety based on psychological welfare of the individual. So, um, the 23andMe story uh, is a little bit complicated by the fact that the FDA had sent a number of warning letters along the way to 23andMe saying, hey, we think you're a medical device. Um, and it started with the kind of idea that maybe what you're offering, the service you're offering as a medical device, the spit kit uh, that you're shipping out to individuals together with the clinical interpretation of the results that they received. Um, and then over time, the warning letters became more and more uh, aggressive saying, you are a medical device and you have failed to um, follow the protocols and the procedures of the FDC and NA to be marketing a medical device. Uh, and then um, the 23andMe failed to respond along the way, which uh, you know sort of made them, um, I think, uh, more likely to get the final stern letter that they received from the FDA that said that you have to stop immediately marketing what you're doing. Uh, and the reason is because you are providing information that we believe is a class three medical device that has not proven safety and efficacy. Now, what that means in, in this context is, is, is really kind of challenging and difficult. So what was happening with these tests is they were sending away a spit kit. People were um, spitting into a tube and then mailing it back to 23andMe. Now, I think we can all agree that there's no safety or uh, harm to an individual in spitting into a test tube, closing the lid, putting it into the mail and sending it off. Um, and so from a safety perspective, uh, the regulation of safety and efficacy certainly can't be about that. 
Um, and what the FDA focused on in their letter and in their concern was um, two different things. They were worried about the analytic validity of the test. That is, if 23andMe was saying that you have um, in these areas of your genome, a C, a T, a G, and A, these um, nucleotides uh, and base pairs that you would have in your DNA, are they accurately reporting that? But they were far less worried about that than the second, which is um, 23andMe was reporting hundreds of different interpretations of what those variations meant. Everything from entertainment, like you have uh, a higher likelihood of um, smelling uh, smelly urine if you eat asparagus or wet earwax, or this is what your predicted eye color is, to things like you have a higher incidence of rheumatoid arthritis or um, early onset Alzheimer's disease or, uh, or breast cancer or other types of conditions. Um, and the FDA was saying that for every single one of those interpretations that 23andMe needed to provide clinical data and studies that validated that, even though there was a tremendous amount of that information in the marketplace. And essentially what 23andMe was doing was sequencing the genome and then using um, existing medical literature and saying, based on these studies that are already published in the marketplace, and here are the citations to those studies, um, you have an increased incidence of these diseases because of these variations you have. Um, and so the idea that uh, the um, that they couldn't do that, they couldn't speak and share the information of already published information and your particular risk as a result of the genetic information that um, had been identified through the sequencing, uh, I thought was appalling. And they essentially shut down that practice. At this point, they've required each indication that is every single interpretation be validated in advance before they will allow 23andMe to report that on its platform. Um, and just a, about a, a week ago, Helix, um, and I sat on their scientific advisory board as a disclosure of conflict of interest, they just had the first whole exome sequencing platform approved by the FDA, which allows for a much broader set of interpretations to be provided. So this is a huge step forward, but this is years later that finally the FDA is loosening the guardrail somewhat on, on testing, which is really just telling you what's in your genome and then what the available information is in the marketplace that provides correlations between your variations in your genome and what it means. Uh, Jessica wanted to say something about equity issues with testing, and then I'm gonna start taking some questions from our participants. Go, go ahead, Jessica. Oh, sure. So just two points. The first is um, to get a story. One thing that our story illustrates is that um, in some ways, even if we have the current system of tests, there's an equity issue, which is that people who live near hospitals, people who have access to be able to get tests quickly, um, they're going to be advantaged in, able, in being able to get access to information about their bodies. And so there's also like an equity issue with people who live far away. Um, from hospitals or medical centers, where for reasons of fairness, you might think you want to expand access to people who aren't necessarily close to like large scale medical centers. And then just to Nita's second point about um, 23andMe, there also are some speech issues at play there because the thing that these types of tests or diagnostics are doing is just giving people truthful information about their own bodies. In general, um, communicating truthful information to people that doesn't advocate for any kind of illegal conduct is protected speech. But in the medical context, FDA, both in regulating diagnostics, but also in regulating things like off-label marketing, um, enforces content-based restrictions on speech, despite the fact that that speech is true and advocates for lawful conduct, and so, or no conduct at all in the case of diagnostics. Um, so there are these censorship issues that are at play also with the way that FDA regulates information and people's access to information. Well, now I was going to save this for the close, but now because you said that, I'm going to have to ask this question <laughs> now, which is, yeah. in principle, is there any difference between a person using a test strip on a sample of their own urine, for example, to screen for a health condition versus searching on the internet for articles that discuss the signs and symptoms of various health conditions 
in order to find out if they have that can might have that condition. And if there is no fundamental difference, number one, should the FDA be regulating internet content pertaining to medical information available to lay people? And isn't wouldn't such an activity be a, a right protected by the First Amendment? And is the FDA's therefore is the FDA's expansive interpretation of its authority under the medical device amendments a possible First Amendment infringement? So should we start with the law professor first? And, answering that sure. question so there's a lot there's a lot there but let me start with the first piece which is, is there a difference um there is a difference and that difference is you're getting individualized information versus general information right when you're searching for your symptoms online unless there is uh a online system which there are some of and there have been some um, apps that have been developed this per for this purpose, which give you customized predictions based on your particular symptoms. If you're just Googling, it is information that nobody has tried to package and sell to you as a medical device uh, versus, um, and so there's no question of, you know, accuracy, specificity, sensitivity of the test and information that you're receiving in the internet versus if you're testing at home, if you're urinating on a strip and seeing whether or not you're pregnant or if you're having some other kind of health condition, um, you'd want to know that that information is accurate, that it's sensitive, and that it's specific. Um, and so having some oversight, I think, of the quality of the test, I'm not opposed to. Um, I think having quality oversight uh, maybe doesn't need to happen pre-market, uh, but it, it, having some oversight of quality, I don't think is, is that deeply problematic. And I do think that there's a difference. That being said, I still think that there is a First Amendment problem with a lot of the kinds of issues that FDA is seeking to regulate, and particularly when the FDA is seeking to regulate information. So in the 23andMe story that I said, um, if 23andMe literally said, here is the variant that you have, right? You have a T in this spot where the normal wild type is a G. Um, and people who have a T in this spot on your genome um, in the following five studies have been shown to have an increased incidence of disease. Um, and here are the studies preventing the 23andMe from being able to share that information is a restriction on the speaker, right? Based on who the speaker is and the content of their speech. And that kind of um, speaker content restriction has been found to run afoul of uh, the First Amendment in several different cases. Uh, and there's been some interesting cases on, the, on this very point, like USB um, Caronia out of the Second Circuit, and there's a Massachusetts Supreme Court case as well. And the FDA finally, after these cases, which they decided not to appeal because they, I think they were afraid of a US Supreme Court ruling that would be particularly problematic for them on the First Amendment, has admitted, finally, that the First Amendment does in fact apply to what they do. And so they're trying to be, I think, more sensitive to information-based regulation. But a lot of what the FDA is trying to do in today's marketplace, a lot of the devices that are out there, um, you know, things like Apple watches that give you ECG measurements and information about your heart rate, um, the different medical apps that are starting to be installed, uh, the information is what makes it a medical device. And FDA seeking to regulate that information does put it into really dangerous territory that I think and expect um, we're going to see a lot more First Amendment challenges going forward, and, and I welcome those. I think we need to figure out what the limitations are on FDA's ability to limit truthful information simply because the speaker is a pharmaceutical company or um, a direct-to-consumer genetic testing company or some other company that is selling a medical device. Interesting. Jessica, you want to chime in on that at all? Yes, totally. So, um I think it's outrageous that FDA was regulating off-label marketing for as long as they were, and to the extent that they still do regulate off-label direct-to-consumer marketing. That is a violation of speech, um, especially because these uh, violations often carry billions of dollars in fines, so they are enforced. Um, and on the wearables point and on the at-home testing things, there are also public health reasons not to impede this. So this goes back to what I was saying earlier of um, you know, we don't look at the public health costs of impeding people having access to this kinds of information or impeding these types of devices. So just thinking about like wearables, at home diagnostics, Apple Watch, things like that. One thing that's like beneficial for those things is that um, they can also inform research, public health research, but even research about um, 
like what are the determinants for a certain can working on different patients because you have real time data that you can collect and by stepping in and preventing people from providing those types of uh, services, providing the information to patients, having the information sharing, it undermines public health on balance out of a misguided desire to protect patients from learning information about their own bodies. So um, I would just like echo everything she said of like, yes, there's the speech issue, but there's also a public health issue. And another difference between, you know, looking up something on Dr. Google versus um, doing an at-home test, for example, or something like that, is that it's likely to be more accurate. And so while on one hand, yes, I acknowledge that individualized information is more likely to be misinterpreted or people are gonna take it more seriously, potentially, that's offset by the fact that they have reason to take it more seriously because it already is often regulated, vetted, standardized, and likely to be more accurate to their particular situations. So those considerations weigh in favor of having even more access to the kind of speech that we get from at-home diagnostics and tests. I'm, I'm gonna start taking some questions. Uh, and if you have questions again, you can send them in on, uh, on our webpage, on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter using the hashtag Cato Health. Um, James asks, my local clinic charges $150 cash for uninsured to get tested and still have to wait several days for a result. Wouldn't at-home testing take money away from those clinics' labs? Is this the reason that direct-to-consumer has not been as readily approved? Anybody have thoughts on that? Uh, I think, Jessica, were you wanting to say something? Well, uh, I mean... I mean <laughs> well, go ahead. Go ahead. well, I'll say this, which is, I mean, I think, I think in this particular instance, it's probably not about individual labs who are fighting against um, the testing. But the old guard of the medical system, that is the, the fact that there is such resistance by um, physicians to have direct to consumer information. Um, some of that is driven by uh, a, a loss of business, a fear of being inundated by questions that they think are inappropriate, a misinterpretation by um, patients who show up with their lab test or really just a lack of education on the part of the physicians. When you show up with your 23andMe test and say, hey, doc, I have all of these predispositions. Um, can you run a whole bunch of additional tests on me? There's a fear of you know, wasteful utilization of physician's time or physician's resources. I think it's less about loss of business and loss of revenue for testing, especially since most offices right now are completely overwhelmed with COVID tests and uh, are, are backlogged. Um, but I do think this resistance to the empowerment of individual consumers to take their health into their own hands um, is a resistance to uh, a, a shifting landscape where the patient is in the driver's seat rather than physicians being in the driver's seat and, and making the calls about what kinds of tests are ordered and what's appropriate and what's the right utilization of the medical system and our resources. Yeah, I would agree with that too, because I remember when the state of Arizona legislature was considering allowing direct-to-consumer lab tests where people can go directly, uh, order their own tests. And the Arizona Medical Association was uh, debating a position on that. And uh, they were deadlocked because about half the people on the committee of the Arizona Medical Association that dealt, that dealt with the issue thought that it would be unsafe, that people wouldn't know how to interpret their lab tests. The other half of the committee felt the other way saying, well, you know, they could always call me for an appointment if they <laughs> don't know how to interpret their lab tests. But so I think that, I think it's more that than the clinical labs putting up a fight. Uh, Jessica, did you want to say something or should I go to the next question? Just to say that more generally, um, systems of complex regulations that are difficult to navigate benefit large existing stakeholders and are generally less favorable to new innovative technology. That's kind of why I was so excited to see Moderna coming up with the vaccine because the whole system does have a sort of status quo bias for existing stakeholders who can navigate the system. Uh, my colleague at the Cato Institute, Michael Cannon, wants to know of, uh, from Anita, did the test make a difference in your case or would your husband have self-isolated even without a rapid test, assuming he had COVID-19 out of an abundance of caution? When he got the Maybe symptoms. we should have, but but no. I mean, he had a very mild fever, um, no other symptoms, no cough, 
nothing. I mean, it was, it was nothing. Like that was it. There was one day of a transient fever. Um, so more likely than not, we would have chalked it up to like, he just didn't get a good night of sleep or who knows. Um, but with a transient low grade fever that lasted for a few hours of a single day and no other symptoms, um, no, he wouldn't have gotten tested. Now it was a full week and a half later that he lost his sense of taste and smell. Um, and so at that point we probably would have gotten him tested, but at that point, you know, it would have been game over. Like everybody in our family would have, um, been sick. And, and I'll tell you just a very personal anecdote, which is we had, um, our second child, uh, who died of a respiratory virus. She died of complications of RSV. Um, and that is part of what makes us much more aggressive in, in wanting to have access to home testing and rapid and early knowledge about viruses and, and their tests. We believe earlier access to testing um, and earlier knowledge about her health and well-being could very well have made the difference in, in, in life or death. But it also tells you that we have been in this pandemic incredibly, incredibly careful. And even still, if we had not had the home test, given how mild his symptoms were, given how quickly they dissipated, we wouldn't have had him tested, you know, until a week and a half later. And probably everybody in our family would have had it. I'm very sorry for your loss, by the way. Um, Thank you. We, we have a question from Mike, I'm, I'm sorry, Mick Pira. Uh, this is a good question. He says, what is a process that might change the FDA's restrictions around at-home COVID testing and the obtaining of the corresponding results. Does anybody have an idea what process might change the restrictions? Uh, how about you, Jessica? Um, well, I'm not quite sure what he means by like what process would change the restrictions. Right now, my impression is that the at-home test, um, even though it's approved, it's unavailable to people. So just increasing availability would be like the first priority, I would think. Um, I do think there are things we could do now to prepare ourselves for the next time that we're in a kind of pandemic situation like this. Um, so one thing would be to have automatic triggers that um, begin as soon as there's a public health emergency declared that really push for expedited EUAs and certifications for labs and testing facilities, and also expedited authorization for at-home testing. So instead of it coming from the current process, which is slow and cumbersome and difficult to navigate, um, kind of pre-committing to expedited uh, authorization for at-home testing and also for lab-based testing, because even earlier in the pandemic, um, that was a big issue of like, finding labs that were certified to conduct tests and finding tests that were reliable. Um, and these things should just be automatic at the point of any kind of um, public health emergency. For home testing, I think legislators could pair support for at-home testing with also greater initiatives to expand telemedicine, at-home monitoring, and like really facilitating those things being reimbursed um, just as a first step. And I mentioned before like equity issues with enabling more people to access medical care at home, which is important for homebound seniors, people in rural areas, people who lack access to reliable transportation. So just on like the reimbursement end, especially in the case of a contagious pandemic, um, that is a way that you could more equitably safeguard not just patients, but their caregivers, families, and communities um, by kind of pairing at-home diagnostics with also increased support for telemedicine and just at home treatment more generally for people. Um, uh, Nita, what, what, what would you suggest that they be as a fix? So, you know, part of what slowed down at home testing to begin with is the ability to have rapid results, right? Which is a PCR test, which you have to amplify with the machine that you have that you know, nobody's going to have at home or have access to at home um, meant earlier in the pandemic, it really just wasn't an option to have the availability of at home testing. And what everybody thought was going to be the game changer was when there could be basic antigen testing. But finding the antigens that could be reliable indicators of SARS-CoV-2 didn't prove to be that easy either. And they weren't as sensitive. 
Um, and a, a second piece of that is, uh, is how you obtain the test, which is there was a belief that a nasopharyngeal swab, you know, kind of had to go up the nasal cavity, really had to be administered by a health professional versus a saliva test, which could be easily administered at home. Um, so I think early investment, which really did happen here, early investment in trying to find antigens and alternative, you know, saliva-based tests that could work um, is, is part of what we need to hope for. We need simple tests that give rapid results and give them with easily administered modalities that can be delivered at home. But it's also clear that in this country, you know, uh, that the priority was not on testing and developing testing kits. Um, and the, the resources and the limitations, whether it's, you know, availability of the pipettes or the nasopharyngeal swabs or the PPE equipment that was necessary to administer those tests, you know, none of the necessary massive scale up of investments to make that possible were happening. And so, you know, I think it's understandable that there was a lag before we had access to home testing. But at this point, it's it's there. There really is very little justification for not putting a tremendous amount of resources into having those tests because it's not just at home testing, right? Public schools throughout the country are still closed, and rapid, easily administered tests could enable those schools to open. Um, and you know, it, it's it's recognizing that the investment in point of care testing. Um, and easily administered tests are fundamental to us being able to restore any kind of normalcy in our lives at this point. Jessica, oh, I think you already addressed that. Actually, I'm sorry. Uh, um, the uh, I would like to ask if, if, in fact, anonymous wants to ask: Are there any currently any lawsuits pending that you're aware of on this particular issue that might? Uh, might have Im significant impl implications. Lawsuits pending Nita? on. Uh, yeah. So so. On Allow, SARS allowing access to. Right. So I'm not aware of SARS-CoV-2, yeah. but I am aware mm -hmm. that there have been um, a number of disputes in the direct-to-consumer genetic testing space uh, that have percolated um, and are percolating on First Amendment challenge grounds, um, and so. It'll be interesting to see it pan out in that space because um, that really starts to wrap up at-home testing, right to self-access and First Amendment challenges, which is the regulation of information and whether or not the FDA has the right to regulate particular speakers and content. Um, but those are the only ones that I'm aware of that are percolating on this you know, kind of right to self-access and information about cells. It'll be interesting to see if there's any in the space of, um, you know, in the context of, of SARS-CoV-2 testing. You know, uh, if a little bit of uh, promotion, self-promotion, uh, this uh, kind of ties into the over-the-counter versus prescription-only uh, drug issue. So, for example, uh, I had a question here from, uh, uh, let me see, it was, uh, I'll try to find the name of the person. Oh, you, uh, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. But somebody said, I, I get an antifungal cream that I could administer myself, but I have to get it prescription only rather than over the counter. Wouldn't it better be better for me to get it over the counter? And this is sort of the same kind of thing. If people were able to get certain drugs over the counter that right now the FDA doesn't allow over the counter in this country, for example, like the albuterol inhalers for asthma, or in the case of the current issue with COVID, um, the, the self-administered at-home COVID test. Just think about how how easy it would be, for example, in schools, you could have this, the self-administered test to, to give to, to students who show up in the classroom and look perhaps uh, a little ill and you can run a test on them. Or, you know, just like having, if, 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 if soccer coaches could have handy the albuterol inhaler, so if a, if a, a child gets an asthma attack, they can uh, treat it without having to get a prescription. So it, it all ties in. And I recommend to people who haven't read it, to go on a Cato Institute website and read a white paper that Michael Cannon and I wrote called Drug Reformation and the Government's Power to uh, Control, to to uh, to, to uh, de determine prescriptions. Um, I think you'll find it interesting because we get into these kind of subjects. It looks like our time is up. This was a really interesting conversation. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to a, a lot of the other questions that have piled up. Um, for those of you who came in on the tail end and missed it, um,
this is going to be, uh, this has been recorded. It's going to be archived. And probably within the next 24 hours, you'll be able to view the entire uh, online event at the Cato Institute website, cato.org. I'd like to thank our excellent guests uh, for participating in this really interesting discussion. And I'd like to thank you all for watching and look for future online events at the Cato Institute. Thank you.